Um, it's now uh, my pleasure to introduce Jacob Polly, this time as a poet, though you've already met him as a judge earlier. Jacob Polly was born in Carlisle. He has three books of poems published by Picador, which have been variously shortlisted for the T.S. Eliot and Forward Prize, and have both, and have both been P uh, Poetry Book Society choices and recommendations. He also has one novel, Talk of the Town, which won the 2010 Somerset Maugham Award. In 2009, Jacob Polly's poem, A Jar of Honey, was recited by the comedian Phil Jupitus as part of a BBC poetry season. From talking to people, I think A Jar of Honey is the poem through which many people, if not most who I've actually spoken to, are first introduced to Jacob Polly's writing, whether they're handed it in a poetry workshop or read it in the newspaper, or like myself, stumbled across it in the anthology Being Alive and found themselves returning to it again and again. You hold it like a lit bulb, a pound of light, the poem begins. And in these opening lines, in the moment the, poem, in the, moment the poet gives substance and weight to something that's essentially insubstantial, one immediately recognizes the reasons for its far-reaching appeal. Reading his most recent collection, The Havocs, one sees Jacob Polly continue to innovate his writing, for instance, by developing ancient forms such as the riddle. The opening poems are marked by a strong sense of the uncanny, particularly in images such as the children's bicycle lying on a riverbed, its wheel pedaled by the current. When I've, uh, I've spoken about Jacob Polly to friends or colleagues and mentioned that he's, been, that he's coming to read, his name has genuinely been met with nothing but praise from those who've known him, either as a teacher or as a poet. And certainly that's been borne out by our, our experience of collaborating with him. So it's my pleasure to introduce him now. Can we please welcome Jacob Polly? So much. That's uh, really, really nice and uh, a really kind introduction. And it's very nice to to be here again, um, as in again from before. You know? <laughs> um, I'm going to read um, from my uh, f first book of poems and my my. Third, in a, in a weird, don't, I don't know why, um, I just am. Um, and being the, the, the brilliant salesman that I am, I, I've not brought any um, to sell, so uh, they are available from any good bookshop or place, you know. Smoke. My father kept a stove with dog's legs on a pink hearthstone. One morning he climbed down the icy stairs and spread his palms on the blood-warm metal flanks. He cranked open the iron doors like a black bank safes, but found no heat and ash heaped in its place. He cracked grey whittled coals, released brief blue flames, and knocked down his soot through the bars of the grate. The ash pan, softly loaded and almost as wide as a doorway, he carried like dynamite through the dark house, his bright face blown with smots. At the back door, he slid the ash into a tin dustbin, then snapped sticks, crumpled newspaper, struck a match and dipped it between the kindling. Smoke unrolled, flames spread, the rush of the stove eating air started up and my father would shake on rocks from an old coal hod and swing the door shut. But this time, he took a book, broke its spine, and slung that on instead. His diaries, year by year, 
heard as their pages burned, their leather boards shifted, popped and fell apart. Soon I would arrive, pulled from under my mother's heart and grow to watch my father break the charred crossbeam of a bird from the flue, wondering if I too had hung in darkness and smoke, looking up at the light let down her throat whenever my mother sang or spoke. First bike. It's maybe not my first bike, but you know, it's, it's somebody's first bike. First bike. There, at the bottom of the river, time slips. The leaves are the leaves of woods long felled, gold still, like treasure. The current turns one wheel as if you had just laid it down to run from year to year, from bright to shade, across the bridge from being young to hear where you stand, unwise and afraid, in grown-up shoes. Your father's hand once steadied you. When he let go, you rode because you didn't know. You rode across the yard to find your balance always was your own. You rode on after dark alone. Um, this is a poem called Salmonry, um, about us, about, no, not about. <laughs> uh, it, it, it grows out of um, uh, the, the fish, you know, Salmonry. I'm just noticing that I'm reading poems where they, they begin this, there, here. Um, and this, this, this poem does that too, Salmonry. This first edition of fish, fillets recto verso, a zinky blue portfolio with an eye ringed in gold leaf turned to the kitchen ceiling, slip case, soft back, uncracked spine, imagine it cruising midstream set against the close grain of the river's current, intractable as shadow. Or think of the failure of seas to swing this jaw back on its ruminative hinge. Somehow, oceans wound up in this skull's square inch, five epics in a nutshell, inscriptions on a fish scale. Yet, when it goes under the grill, tuned to the softest gas flame, it's our mouths that fill with a fathom of water. This gauntlet of gently rusted armor I lay between us. It's for us to chew over, to take issue, not with each other, but with the arrangement of sea salt and coarse pepper on the tongue, with the backbone and finer points of fish grammar. Already the butters loose in the margins, illuminating the edge of each plate. So here's the fish knife, here's the fork. Find your place marked with parsley and begin. I've got um, a, a, a couple of uh, poems that, that, that grow um, out, of, out of painting or art or 
or out of writing about painting and art, not my writing, but other people's. Um, and I'll read those, seeing as we're in such... Um, I would have read them anyway, maybe, but um, I'll read them because we're in the a gallery, obviously. Um, the first one is called Renaissance, and it's after Bill Berkson. Um, and it's, it's actually a poem, it's a found poem, so it's a poem made of, of um, a, a, a section of, of an essay by Bill Berkson about um, uh, Piero della Francesca, the, the Italian artist, uh, painter. Um, so they're Bill's, um, Bill Berkson's words with some adjustments. Renaissance. Cracklings and abrasions, cracked boards and wormhole hollowings, scalings off, oxidizings, greens gone to brown or black, chemical shifts in and over painting, structural interpolations and deletions by restorers and less scrupulous antiquaries. Whole works have been destroyed and parts of panel paintings hacked away. Rare the item that's escaped abuse. At Arezzo, the Magdalene fresco appears superbly intact until one notes the large disfiguring splotch thanks to splashings from the font. Eviction, and this is um, a, a, a poem after a painting by Masaccio in, um, in Florence. Eviction, barefoot they've entered the outermost place. She covers her breasts, he hides his face. Behind them stands the light-filled grey stone arched city doorway. The unworked earth is parched. Their shadows lag and elongate, longing towards the shade. Everything waits to be suffered, as now the garden streams and orchards lie outside their lives in dreams. He howls into his hands, her upturned foreheads smooth and white, her small mouths tearing wide. They are, after all, only adequate and flesh and grieve at the easily understood threshold of grief from where one fully dressed and armed shoes them indifferently into the West. No. So I'm reading from this, this one. <laughs> the first, I can do that. Uh, the, the, my, the first book of poems called The Brink and, um, and the third called, called The Havocs here. So um, some of them, are f some obviously, some poems are from that one and some from that one. Snow. It survives in quiet places like a rare species whose habitat is silence and closed roads. It upholsters the empty park bench with long creaking bolsters and lags the fields like drafty lofts. Look up, the night's in pieces or the moon sieving its desiccated seas. There's a glamour about the roofs, and even the old car on bricks in the yard seems natural, tucked up to the axles in this delicate impasse. Bridle path and motorway unite under the wastes of space 
each gale force renovates and only the cat and the blackbird betray themselves so neatly in the lawn's flawless enamoring that we'll forgive their few footnotes at dawn when we open our doors and the hard-packed white light lent against them falls in. Um, this is a kind of um, uh, a, a kind of riddle poem, I suppose. Um, Martin mentioned this uh, the, the the kind of use of, of some of these older um, probably you know forms that are probably as old as as as, as we are um, as a as a as an animal. Um, but this is an animal poem um, spoken in the voice of of the creature. The kick. Try to, and you cannot home me here in the long land of new furrows where I hunker, squat, and sleeken, all haunch with ears stowed. I could be earth itself, but I am not and nor do I know any way into or beneath it. I sit days out, be they rainbowed, thunderstruck, bald or wisped, and come the dusk, I lollop to crop and work the green corn shoots, clover, and the dew-clean dandelion leaves. I lie. I did not want to move, but started, I opened air between us, for there is in me such unbelonging that given you a small excuse, I kick the world away. Um, I, I think I'll read two two more poems, and then that will be me. And thank you. It's been so nice to be here, and I hope you've hope you've enjoyed your your Saturday here. Um, The weasel. Up and down the London road, blinder by the hour, I spent as much again as we owed white winter flowers. Crowds and crowds like fallen leaves blown between the towers. You came in with the cold up your sleeves, white winter flowers. Screams and shouts and broken things. Now you're fired and cower under the sheets when the postman brings white winter flowers. Who'd have dreamt a little twist could turn your sweet breath sour? I tasted this when we first kissed white winter flowers. For your whole heart is half my heart, my heart is half of yours. So we're neither complete and lie drunk in the street, white winter flowers. Doll's House. A table set with tiny plates, the chairs around a paper fire. Diminishment has simplified the aims and objects of desire, while blinder faith must still provide the mincemeat in the wooden cakes, the creaking stair and wind outside. 
For you have held your breath to peer along the shelves of depthless books lining a room where nothing's read. And now, effortlessly giant, look up to the eaves and in at the beds. Be brave. To live is not to fear, despite the scale of what's at stake. Two children lie in matchbox cribs. Next door, a couple, stiff as pegs, are tucked together, rib to rib, the bedsheets bound around their legs. What happens if you turn away? Every god has asked the same, crouched at a sideboard, just in case sudden little laughter shakes a heaven like an empty house where not a plate nor day will break. Thank you.